Good evening. It's strange to be introduced as a guest now, but I guess that's what happens when you move away. <laughs> Life is full of, uh, it's full of strange things, it's full of strange things, and you read the Bible, and I love the strange things that happen in the Bible that are hard for us to understand, and one of those instances comes in all four of the Gospels, when Jesus is, is put before Pilate, and he's about to go to the cross, but something has to happen. Before, the, before Jesus can die, someone goes through another process. A whole other scenario, a whole other story is contained within the story of Jesus going to the cross. And it's, it's become, over the past few months, in my studies at, at Freed, and my studies of the life of Christ, one of my favorite parts of the gospel. And I think it's... it's it's one of those that we talk about all the time because it, it so accurately and poignantly describes our journey as Christians and what happened to us and Jesus taking our place. But I think that just as much as that, it's a call for us to evangelize and to take the gospel to everybody. And, and we're going to talk tonight about, if you're taking notes, the title of our lesson is going to be, What Did They Do With Barabbas? What Did They Do With a rebel, and a murderer, and a thief. What did they do with this man? Introducing Barabbas, who I call the notorious freedman, because he is described in Scripture as a criminal, of somebody who should not have the freedom that he does. All the same, though, the last we hear of him, he is released from his chains. He's first introduced to us in the book of Matthew. In chapter 27, verse 16, Matthew writes, And they had then a notorious prisoner called Barabbas, then again in Mark chapter 15, verse 7, And among rebels in prison who had committed murder in the insurrection, there was a man called Barabbas. Luke chapter 23, verse 19, A man who had been thrown into prison for an insurrection started and for murder. And then John 18, 40, They cried out again, now Barab They cried out again, Not this man, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a robber. So you see this picture that's painted of Barabbas. In every instance in when he's introduced in Scripture, he's not exactly talked about in a very positive light. He's talked about as somebody who's about to get the thing that he deserves, which is punishment, and it's death. Yet, Barabbas has such little control over his story that we see in all of the, what is talked about. So tonight, I want to take it from the angle of what did they do with Barabbas? They first being Pontius Pilate. What did Pilate do with Barabbas? First, he puts Barabbas up for the Jews. He puts Barabbas up for sale. Pilate goes before the Jews. If you want to turn to Matthew chapter 27, we're going to read part of this, this account of, that Matthew gives of the crucifixion and the, the trial that's taking place. So in Matthew chapter 27, we're going to begin in verse 15. We're going to read through verse 18. Matthew chapter 27, beginning in verse 15. Now at the feast, the governor was accustomed to releasing to the multitudes one prisoner whom they wished. And at that time, they had a notorious prisoner called Barabbas. Therefore, when they had gathered together, Pilate said to them, Who do you want me to release to you, Barabbas or Jesus, who was called the Christ? For he knew that they had handed him over because of envy. So here in this passage that we read in Matthew chapter 27... Pilate puts Barabbas up for auction for the Jews. This is what we call um, the Paschal Pardon. Because at the time of Passover, which is what the Jews had just finished, finished celebrating the night before on this Thursday night, it's now Friday morning when Jesus is on trial, this is the time of year when to keep a rapport going with the children of Israel, to keep them from equating their Roman rule to the same bondage they did in Egypt, which they would have been thinking about around this time of year, the Roman government decides that at this point they're going to release a prisoner that the Jews choose back to them. And so Pilate, he's trying to exercise that here. And he gives the Jews a choice. He says, you can have Jesus, who is called the Christ, or you can have Barabbas, who is a prisoner, who's a murderer, who's a thief. He gave the Jews this choice, and he gave them Barabbas specifically because they were not supposed to pick him. That's a very important part of this story to understand, is that the Jews were supposed to pick Jesus. Because Pilate, Pilate's a politician. Uh, he wants to keep everyone happy. So if he gives the, the Jews the choice between Jesus and Barabbas, he can kill two birds with one stone. He can have the Jews brand Jesus a criminal, 
because that's how he's releasing Jesus back to him. The Jews can brand Jesus as a criminal. They can see him for what they believed he was, but he can also go over to the other side and he can take Barabbas and he can put him up. He can hang him on a cross for the crimes that he committed, just like he was supposed to. That's what Pilate's job was. It was to put down insurrection, to put down criminals. Pilate was the governor of Judea, which in this time was more of a, of a military role rather than a diplomatic one the way that we think about it. So Pilate was just trying to do his job. Of course, Pilate, uh, we all know how the story ends. Pilate didn't do his job very well. And he ends up acting like a politician and doing what they do, and he releases Jesus, or he releases Barabbas in place of Jesus. He takes Jesus and gives him to the Jews and gives up Barabbas, who had actually committed all of these crimes. Turn now to, go to Luke chapter 23. There's an another part of the account of the crucifixion of Jesus that Luke writes about. And this part of the account is a conversation that happens. And it happens between the crowd, the high priest, and the Pharisees, and the Jews, and Pilate. Beginning verse 20, right after, they, right after Pilate suggests that they have Barabbas, verse 20 reads, Pilate therefore, wishing to release Jesus again, called out to them, but they shouted, saying, Crucify him, crucify him. Then he said to them a third time, Why? What evil has he done? I have found no reason for death in him. I will therefore chastise him and let him go. But they were insistent, demanding with loud voices that he be crucified. And the voices of these men and of the chief priests prevailed. So Pilate gave sentence that it should be as they requested. And he releases them, to them the one they requested, who for rebellion and murder had been thrown into prison, but he delivered Jesus to their will. He does what he's supposed to do, and he keeps the people happy. But he does it in such a cowardly way. Because we see, especially in these verses, but in all four gospel accounts, Pilate says that he finds no fault in Jesus. He does not think that Jesus has done anything wrong. He thinks that Jesus is an innocent man. And he is not worthy of death. And that he also, conversely, because he knows that the Jews put Jesus up because of their envy of him, because he knows that the Jews really didn't think that Jesus deserved death, they just wanted him gone. He puts up Barabbas because he's trying to take the easy way out instead of just exercising the authority that he has. But Mark chapter 15, verse 15, tells us exactly where Pilate's heart was. Because it says, so Pilate wishing to satisfy the crowd, released for them Barabbas, and having scourged Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. The passage we read in Luke says he delivered him into the hands of the Jews. Of course, we know that Pilate washes his hands because he wants to be innocent of the blood that he knows the Jews are going to take, the innocent blood that he knows that the Jews are going to take. He delivers them to the Jews and says, do what you want with them. I have no part in this. I also wonder if it might have been Pilate's way of talking about how pompous the Jews were in the ceremonial way that they would wash their hands. I wonder if he mimicked that when he claimed that he was washing away his own sin. Of course, we know the only way that we can wash away sin is through contacting the blood of Jesus. It's ironic that the only way to wash yourself of the guilt, the only way to wash yourself of the innocent blood of Jesus is to literally wash yourself in his blood. But Pilate thought washing his hands would be enough. So what did Pilate do with Barabbas? He put him up for auction, and then he released him. And he took Jesus in his place. And the next part of the story, we, we ask, what did Jesus do with Barabbas? Very simply, Jesus did one thing with Barabbas. He took his place. That's all that Jesus did. He took his place, and he took it happily. Maybe not happily, but willingly. Um... A few months ago, we, we do this thing every Wednesday night at school. It's called Clayton Chapel Singing. And, and as many students that want to will gather in this little chapel. It's probably, probably a, less than a quarter of the size of this auditorium. The whole building is. And at about 10.30 on Wednesday night, after a long day of studying, going to worship that evening, we'll gather in Clayton Chapel and we'll turn out all the lights. And uh, everyone just sits down at the floor and we just sing. And whoever, whatever male wants to start a song, he can and I remember one Wednesday night, we, we were singing, and we began to sing Night with Eben Pinion. And we got to the third verse, which is Jesus, it's the prayer of Jesus in the garden. And sitting there in this darkness, with only the moonlight coming through the windows of this chapel, 
I think was the first time I ever really understood how Jesus felt about going to the cross. Sitting there in the darkness, Jesus had some of his close friends with him in the garden. As I had some of my closest friends around me as we were singing and began to sing, Abba, Father, Father, if indeed it may, let this cup of anguish pass from me, I pray. Yet if it must be suffered by me, thine only Son, Abba, Father, Father, let thy will be done. Jesus took Barabbas' place, but he did so in anguish, but he did so willingly. John chapter 19, verses 8 through 11. If you want to turn there, we'll, we'll read this passage next. This is, this is a conversation that happens between Jesus and Pilate. See, uh, John, when he writes his gospel, he writes to the church. John's theme is love, how much Jesus loved the church, how much Jesus loved the people that he was going to die for. So that's why John's account of the crucifixion is, has some of the most detail, from when Jesus is praying in the garden, even up till now, and all the things that Jesus said to Pilate and that were said to him. So beginning in verse 8, Therefore, when Pilate heard that saying, he was more afraid. That's after the, the Jews had said it's not lawful for us to put Jesus to death, but we want to. After Pilate hears this saying, he was more afraid and went again into the praetorium and said to Jesus, Where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. Then Pilate said to him, Are you not speaking to me? Do you not know that I have the power to crucify you and the power to release you? Jesus answered, You could have no power against me at all unless it had been given you from above. Therefore, the one who delivered me to you has the greatest sin. This shows exactly how willing Jesus was to do what he was about to do. Because if Pilate's power can only be granted from above, who's above? Jesus. Jesus and his Father and the Holy Spirit are all above Pilate. And they had all conspired together. I hesitate to use that word because of the connotation it was. But they had formulated this plan that Jesus would come and die. But the only way that they could do that is if Pilate has the power to both crucify and to release Jesus. We sing the song, He could have called 10,000 angels to destroy the world and set Him free. That's mirroring the passage when, when Peter is with Jesus in the garden and they come to arrest Him. And Jesus looks at Him and says, Do you not think that even now I could call even 12 legions of angels and end all of this? When Jesus is praying in the garden was when He could have, he could have escaped it all. He could have proved Himself at His tri trial before Pilate and He could have come down off the cross, but He didn't. He willingly took Barabbas' place because that's what he was supposed to do. That's what he came to do. He came to give his life as a ransom for many. He carried Barabbas' cross. Now think about this. Barabbas is in prison. Very likely, it's that the prison would have also been attached to the place where Pilate lived. It would have been this kind of palace like you see kind of in the, the medieval movies, the, the jail and the castle are the same place. And so Pilate, he's sitting in prison one day. He's sitting by himself. And he's sitting and he's thinking to himself that he's going to die. They say that when men or women are executed, that, that they'll, they'll sometimes mimic whatever they're about to undergo. So like if you're about to be in the electric chair, they, they say they would practice holding their breath. Or if they were about to be hung, they would rub their necks. I wonder if Pilate was rubbing his wrists because he knew about the nails that were about to be put through them. He's sitting there he's afraid. As any man would be, he's about to die. Jesus even knew what was on the other side and he was still afraid of what was about to happen. So Pilate, he's sitting in his cell and suddenly he just hears his name. Over and over, the crowds are calling out his name. Barabbas, Barabbas, we want Barabbas. They're calling for his execution, of course. If that's the conclusion that he has to draw. What else would they be asking for? He's murdered people. He's committed rebellion. He's stolen. He's broken two of the Ten Commandments in the eyes of the Jews. They would hate this man. The Pharisees would hate anyone who broke the Ten Commandments. Surely, the reason that they were calling out his name over and over again, and the reason that he's hearing them shout, crucify him, crucify him, crucify him, over and over, is that they want him to die. So he's prepared himself for this. And he's sitting there and he's thinking... Because he doesn't hear the other side of the conversation that's Pilate's voice of saying, who do you want? And they cry for the release of Barabbas. What do you want to be done with Jesus? And they hear, he hears them cry out to crucify him. 
and what it must have been like for him to go on the walk down the long hallway of the prison, how he must have walked out with the chains around his wrist, and he's looking down, maybe rubbing his wrist, rubbing the chains, and they, they loose the chains, and he's expecting them to hand him his cross, and he looks up and somebody else is holding it. How confused he must have been. How must he have felt to see another man taking on his punishment? He has no idea why at this point. What it must have been like to see another man taking his place. But we'll, we'll talk more about that in a second. Jesus took Barabbas' cross. We read about this in Acts chapter 3, verses 13 through 15. Peter preaching in Solomon's portico says, The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, the God of our fathers glorified his servant Jesus, whom you delivered over and defended in the presence of Pilate when he had decided to release him. But you denied the holy and righteous one and asked for a murderer to be granted to you. And you killed the author of life whom God raised from the dead. To this we are witnesses. I love the phrasing at the end of that from Peter. You killed, killed the author of life who was raised from the dead, whom God raised from the dead. Jesus takes on Barabbas' cross by taking his place. He carries this cross that's meant for Barabbas. And one thing that, that I find very striking is that he takes on one of his charges. The three things that Barabbas has against him. Insurrection, murder committed during that same rebellion, and robbery. Pilate knows he can't kill an innocent man. And there's no way that he's going to go to Caesar and tell him he killed an innocent man. But if Jesus is really saying he's king of the Jews, then that means that Jesus has committed against Rome insurrection. So if Caesar goes and he tells Pilate goes to Caesar and Caesar says, did you, kill, uh, Bar did you kill the guy who was starting all those rebellions in Judea? No, no, I didn't. What? Why in the world would you have set that man free? Why would you let him go back to the Jews? Well, you see, Caesar, I found somebody else. Somebody they said, he, he claimed he was the king of the Jews. Keep that in mind. He, they said he claimed he was the king of the Jews. And he said, if, if he's king of the Jews, that means you're not. And if he's the son of God, then that means he's on the same playing field as you. So see, Caesar, I was doing you a favor is likely the conversation that Pilate would have tried to have. Of course, if you go through and read the history of the rest of Pilate's rule, that's not at all what happened. In fact, because Pilate, a lot of people theorize that because Pilate set free a known insurrectionist, that's the reason that his rule was after this plagued by rebellion. The reason that Pilate lost his job as governor was because he failed to put down an insurrection that took place in Samaria. Some people think that that might have been God's way of punishing him for releasing a known rebel and killing his son in his place. Um, that's theory. It's, I don't really know. I can't, I can't speak for that. I can't speak for God's intentions with Pontius Pilate after his son was killed. But I do know this, that the official reason that they had to kill Jesus was because of insurrection. That's the only way they, they can kill him. And get this, insurrection is rebellion. If Jesus is killed for rebellion, that covers every single sin. Because sin is a transgression of the law. Sin is rebelling against God's law. So how can Jesus take on every sin of the world? Well, physically, in a, in a political sense, in a lawful sense here on earth, he only needed to take on one. And he hangs guilty of that. And that's why they put him on the cross. That's why he took Barabbas' place. He takes Barabbas' cross. He takes one of Barabbas' charges. And he has it laid on him and he takes it as his own. And finally we come to what did Barabbas do? We talked a whole lot about everyone else in this story. What, what did everybody else in the story of Barabbas do? What did Barabbas do? And the short answer is, I have no idea. Couldn't tell you. We can fantasize, we can romanticize, we can theorize, but the truth is we don't know. We don't know what would have happened 
to Barabbas. We don't know what he would have done. We don't know if he turned back to his old ways. We don't know if he took his freedom and left. All this speculation, in my, in my research for this lesson, I ran across a number of movies and books that had been written about people theorizing what they think it might have been like for Barabbas to, to see the trial of Jesus through his eyes or, to, or what, what he might have done. I think there was a movie about the life of Barabbas after being freed and him searching for salvation. We don't know any of that. It's all what ifs, it's all conjecture, but I, I do know this. He had options. And coincidentally, there are a lot of the same options that we all have. He could have taken his freedom and gone. He could have walked away. He could have find a, found a nice, quiet corner of the world, and he could have disappeared forever. Never committed another crime. Never again on the radar of Rome. Never again talked to one of the disciples of Jesus. Never again talked to one of the Jews. He could have, he could have disappeared. He could have continued in his ways. He could have had, this, had Jesus taken his place, let Jesus die in his place, and then been on a cross the very next week for whatever he might have done. We don't know. Maybe he was a repeat offender, and that's why they had sentenced him to die. Or maybe he inquired about this man who took his place. Remember that, that story, that, we, that stage we set about Barabbas walking out and seeing his cross put on somebody else who he'd never seen before? Surely that man, he thinks, surely that man has to be worse than me. And if Barabbas is so bad and knows that he's so bad, surely he's going to ask, what did that guy do? How do I make sure to not? And then he finds out by just asking around that Jesus didn't do anything. He was the sinless son of God. He, he goes to one of Jesus' disciples and he says, who is, who took my place? And they said, the Lord and Savior who you and the rest of the Jews had been waiting for. And just maybe, he follows the man who did. I don't know. I'm the kind of person who likes to give the benefit of the, the, benefit of the doubt. I'd like to think maybe one day I'll, I'll, I'll get to the, the gates of heaven and I'll be talking with all those people who I love who've gone on before and I'll be talking with the great thinkers of the past, great theologians, and maybe one of those will be Barabbas. Because telling the story of Jesus taking your place, that'll preach. Barabbas would have been pretty good at telling that story. He would have told it a lot, I assure you. But, you know, we don't know. But at the beginning of this lesson, we talked about the call to evangelism that comes from this story. And I want you to, we need to realize there is no one so bad that Jesus did not take their place. Because at the end of the day, Jesus was on trial he had false accusations laid against him. He was falsely accused of committing rebellion against Rome. Barabbas deserved everything that Jesus got from the beatings, the crown of thorns thrust into his head, the whippings, and ultimately being crucified. But even though he was a murderer, even though he had stolen, even though he had committed rebellion against his government that God had put over his people, Jesus still willfully took his place. There is no one so bad that the gospel cannot save. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9-11, through 11, Paul reads, Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you. But you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. We can do any of these things that Barabbas did ourselves. And anyone who we take the gospel to has that option. But it's very important to know that when in the great we are Barabbas metaphor that's in Scripture... Jesus took the place of the worst of the worst, of a murderer, of, an, of a rebel, of a thief. Now this, this for us today, 
is twofold. It's, it's of course, that, that reminder that Jesus took our place. That's what this story literally is, Jesus taking somebody's place. But also, when we think somebody doesn't deserve the gospel, when we don't want to take the gospel to the prisons, when we don't want to take the gospel to the gamblers, to the alcoholics, to the drug addicts, to the, the porn addicts, to the mothers who have aborted their children, to the thieves, to the real murderers, to, to the fathers who have abandoned their wives and their children, to all of these vile people as we see them, we need to remember that Jesus still took those on Him. Their rebellions against God are what killed Jesus. The same way that mine are and that yours are. There is nobody on this earth that Jesus did not die for. And we can't afford to act like there is. We sing over and over, the gospel is for all. But are we taking it to everybody? So now I'm going to ask you this final question, and that is, what will you do with Barabbas? Will you sit and will you read this story and say, yeah, that's really great that Jesus took Barabbas' place just like he took mine? Or will you realize that Jesus took the place of the worst of the worst and they deserve to know? Jesus took the place of everyone. He took my place. Because I got, I got one thing in common with Barabbas, and that's I rebelled against the law. Maybe not the law of Rome, but I rebelled against the law of God. Which if he was a murderer and thief, he did too. That's two of the Ten Commandments. They're right next to each other in Exodus 20. I am Barabbas because I've rebelled against the law. We are all Barabbas because we have rebelled against the, the law. And the world is full of Barabbases, of Barabbi, if you will, that are waiting to hear the gospel. Jesus didn't say, take the gospel to whoever you feel comfortable with. He didn't say, take the gospel to those who you think deserve to hear it. He said, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. What will you do with Barabbas? What will you do as Barabbas? Will you sit by? Will you take your freedom and go? Or will you stand now and follow Jesus? Will you yourself stand up and make the decision tonight that you will no longer sit by, you will no longer watch this man hang in your place? We're about to sing in a second, oh, why not tonight? Why not? Why, let, why wait any longer when Jesus has already taken your place. He's already given himself for you. All you have to do is accept it. Please come now as we stand and as we sing. Oh,